student that is supposed to be joining to going live now okay webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees awesome Well, it is 2.30 and I want to welcome everyone to St. Olaf College presentation today. My name is Mariana Ruano and I will be facilitating today's session. Um, welcome once again to the virtual college exploration for all Illinois students sponsored by the Illinois Association for College Admission Counseling and Strive Scan. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I want to mention just a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. Uh, for our audience, you can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any time. Your camera and microphone are off so the panelists cannot see or hear you. This is just one of many different sessions happening today and this week. So we encourage you to visit the full schedule for these presentations at IACAC.org. Um, and just so you know as well, the presentation is being recorded and will be available within a week at the same website, IACAC.org. And with no further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Welcome everyone and hello from St. Olaf. Um, my name is Katie. I am one of the admissions officers here at the college. I am a 2018 grad, so I did go to St. Olaf. Um, when I was at St. Olaf, I was an economics major and a finance major as well. And um, my current territory for St. Olaf in terms of recruiting is actually not Illinois. I used to have Illinois and I loved Illinois so much, but now I have North Dakota and South Dakota, Northern Minnesota and Michigan. Um, I have two other St. Olaf um, student and professor with me today. So I'm gonna let Tom introduce himself and then Rebecca introduce herself after. Hi everyone, my name is Tom Williamson and I'm a professor of anthropology at St. Olaf. I've been here now for 20 years and I'm actually also an alum of the college. I graduated way back in 1986. And then my name is Rebecca and I'm a senior here at St. Olaf, so I'm a current student. Um, I'm a religion major with a race and ethnic studies concentration. Um, but I'm pre-health, so planning on going into public health. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca and Tom. So I'm going to share my screen and go through a quick presentation of St. Olaf, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions. Um, you can ask specific questions to um, either myself, Tom, or Rebecca. So feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A as I'm presenting, and we'll get to them after. So, like I said, welcome to St. Olaf. St. Olaf is a small liberal arts college located in Northfield, Minnesota, which is about 45 minutes south of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, Northfield shares Carleton College, or Carleton and St. Olaf share Northfield. So Northfield is a small college town and has lots of coffee shops, restaurants, things to do in town, but we are located on a hill just about a mile from downtown Northfield. Um, St. Olaf is about 3,000 students, so we graduate between 700 and 800 students every year. And we also um, have an emphasis on interdisciplinary style teaching as well as the liberal arts. So at St. Olaf, about a third of your classes will be your major, about a third of your classes will be general education requirements, and about a third of your classes will be electives. At St. Olaf, we do have 85 plus majors and concentrations. Concentrations are pretty much just minors, like at any other school, we just call them concentrations. So most range from five to seven courses and you really can pair any concentration with any major. So when I talk about interdisciplinary style teaching, 
kind of like Rebecca, we have students who take a wide variety of courses and pair a lot of different majors with a lot of different concentrations. So you could be interested in STEM and you also could be interested in women and gender studies or race and ethnic studies and you can pair those two together similar with any other major concentration at St. Olaf. We are on a 414 calendar which means that we take four classes in the fall, one over January or interim, and then four classes in the spring. Interim is something that a lot of colleges have, but unique to St. Olaf is you have to take three out of your four January or interim terms at St. Olaf. And during that time, you can take a class on campus. You can do an internship or research opportunity. You also can study abroad as well. And studying abroad during interim is a very popular thing to do at St. Olaf. And I'll talk a little bit about study abroad in a minute. St. Olaf is a intensely residential campus and pretty much what that means is 95% of students live on campus all four years and you are guaranteed housing all four years on campus. Um, we do have 11 residence halls on campus. There are a lot of options for different types of living. So we have double rooms, um, quad rooms, we have honor houses which are full functioning houses where you live with a group of St. Olaf students and you basically um, have a, a common interest and you plan to um, program different events around that interest. So some examples would be, um, we always have a gender and sexuality house. We always have a sustainable food house. There's, um, there's been a women in sports house, a pre-health house, um, and then there's also language houses as well. So. You basically live with students for that year and you program events around the topic that that house is focused on. We have one campus dining hall on campus and I like to say that this is the epicenter of campus because all students eat in this dining hall and you really get the feeling of community when you are all eating together in the same place. We also have pretty good food on campus, lots of different um, types of food and the food changes almost every day. We also have a coffee shop on campus and a late night food type place on campus too that has pizza, ice cream, cookies, milkshakes, that kind of food as well. A little bit about our students on campus. So about 10% of our students are international students and 22% of our students are domestic students of color. And along with that, I also like to talk about um, some of the different student organizations on campus during the slide and we do have over 200 um, student clubs and organizations on campus and those range from academic clubs to um, athletic clubs to um, religious clubs. I'm trying to think there's so many that you can choose from and if you don't see one um, at our co-curricular fair at the beginning of the year you can make your own club or organization as well. We have a really active student government and a lot of performing arts clubs. So 30% of our students participate in performing arts at St. Olaf and 30% of students participate in varsity or club athletics at St. Olaf outside of um, the other student clubs and organizations on campus. We are nationally accredited in theater, music, art, and dance. So if you are looking for a conservatory type feel on campus but still want to get the liberal arts education, you can do that at St. Olaf. And we do have a large majority of students that are doing that. But if you do not want to major in music, theater, art, or dance, and you still want to participate in one of our 18 music ensembles or five theater productions, two dance companies, or two art galleries at St. Olaf, you can still do that without majoring in music, theater, art, or dance. So really the options for you in terms of extracurricular acti activities at St. Olaf is endless. I mentioned study abroad already, but at St. Olaf, we do have 75% of students that study abroad at least one time during their four years at St. Olaf. And the most popular time to study abroad is over that January term or interim. So during that time, you go abroad with around 10 to 20 St. Olaf students and one to two faculty and staff members from St. Olaf. And you would study a specific topic in that country that you're going to 
We do have trips that go nationally within the U.S. as well, but most of them do go abroad. We have trips that go all over Europe, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, South America. Really, they go everywhere. And kind of the toughest question I always get about study abroad is what the most popular trip is. And in terms of interim, almost every year all the trips are filled. So it's hard to say which one is the most popular because students just love studying abroad at St. Olaf. You don't need to study abroad within your major. So you can really pick and choose any of the study abroad programs that St. Olaf has to offer. We also do have your traditional study abroad programs where you go for a semester to another university in another country and study there for the semester. We also have two unique programs at St. Olaf that are semester long study abroad programs. One is called Global. Global is a semester long program where you go to five countries over that um, semester and you go with a group of St. Olaf students and faculty and staff from St. Olaf, similar to your interim or January term, but just for a semester. And we also have a trip that's an environmental studies trip that goes for a semester in the spring and that is environmental studies based and it goes to New Zealand. And then our Piper Center. Our Piper Center is our career center at St. Olaf and it is probably the most invaluable thing that St. Olaf has to offer, at least in my opinion. And they really help with everything from helping you figure out what you want to major in based on your interest. They also help you figure out how that major will translate into a career. They help with cover letters, resumes, finding an internship or research opportunity, and then ultimately finding a job or applying to grad school or doing one of those service, full year service opportunities like the Peace Corps, Lutheran Corps, AmeriCorps, Teach for America. They also award annual funding for internships. So if you get a non-paid or underpaid internship and you are looking for funding to help fund that time when you are in that internship, the Piper Center will help with that funding. We have a strong alumni network as well. Obviously, Tom and I liked St. Olaf so much that we still work at St. Olaf, but we also have a lot of alums that work across the U.S. that like to hire Oles as well as help with internships and research opportunities. This past year, just because of COVID, about um, 100 internships were created just by alums for St. Olaf students and all of the funding, if the companies could not pay for those interns, was funded through the Piper Center. So, just one example of how alums like to help out current St. Olaf students, but really that is one of the biggest benefits of going to St. Olaf, in my opinion. And then lastly, a little bit about the application process. So we do have four rounds for our application. Early decision one and two, the only difference is the deadline, but early decision is a binding agreement between you and St. Olaf saying that you are going to attend St. Olaf if you get in. Early action and regular decision are non-binding. So the difference is when you apply and when you find out, but those are non-binding and you would let us know and deposit by May 1st for those deadlines. We do have part one, which is just a questionnaire that you can fill out on our website, indicating potentially what application you'd be interested in applying with if you choose to apply. It's just a questionnaire, but you don't need to necessarily apply if you fill out the questionnaire, but it allows us to gauge interest and see how many students are interested in applying to St. Olaf. We also have part two, which is just your general application. So we are on the Common App and Coalition App. We do require a St. Olaf supplement, which is an extra 100 word essay and a few short answer questions, your high school transcript, and then one academic recommendation letter. We do want that from a teacher, um, but if you do choose to send in a second recommendation letter from an extracurricular activity or something of that nature, you can do that as well. And then this year we have gone test optional. That's not just for this year, but for um, the foreseeable future. So you do not need to submit your test score, um, but you can if you choose to. And then lastly, St. Olaf is committed to meeting 100% of dem demonstrated financial need. That means that when you submit your FAFSA and also your CSS profile, we meet 100% of need based off of those two documents. The average need-based financial aid package for St. Olaf is around $45,000 a year and 79% of students are receiving some type of need-based financial aid from St. Olaf. We also do have merit scholarships. You are automatically considered for merit scholarships when you apply. 
um, and 98% of students are receiving either merit-based scholarships or need-based financial aid to attend St. Olaf. That was a really quick um, introduction to St. Olaf, but I'm going to stop there and allow to answer some questions. So let me see if we have any yet. Okay, so let's hear from both Tom and Rebecca about why you chose St. Olaf. Maybe for Tom, potentially why you've stayed at St. Olaf. Um, we'll start there and then Rebecca, you can answer um, why you chose St. Olaf. Well, I really like working with St. Olaf students. They are um, adventurous and smart and they also don't come with a strong sense of entitlement. So it's a nice combination and um, makes for good interactions in class. Also students who are just seeking something, finding their place in the world. And so I like, I really value those opportunities to talk with students about what they wanna do, what they wanna do next, um, how to make the most of this opportunity, and then how to make some, some good decisions that will set them up for um, the life to come. That's you know, sometimes often about jobs and other things, but it's also about just how do I wanna be in the world? Um, how do I want to be part of a community? How do I, how do I want to try and make change? And so that's really um, fulfilling to have the chance to work with students that way. Awesome. What about you, Rebecca? Yeah, so um, I would say that I chose St. Olaf for three reasons um, that I sort of like narrowed down to. Um, the first reason for me was location. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but I'm from the Chicago suburbs, and so it's about a six-hour drive away from home for me, and I felt like I was far enough away from home um, that my parents can't just, like, come surprise me, so I get independence that way, but I'm also close enough um, that if I needed to, like, go home for a weekend for some reason, um, it wouldn't be too hard. It's about an hour flight from the airport in Minneapolis to Chicago, which is not bad. Um, the second reason for me was music, actually. Um, didn't fully go through with this, but I was very involved in music in high school. I played the violin and was an orchestra, and I was thinking it would be nice to be at a school where I could like continue that, take lessons, or be in an orchestra didn't end up going that route. I went the athletics route instead, but um, it was nice to know that I had that option if I wanted to do that. And then the third reason, which also doesn't quite apply to me as much anymore, was I came into college pre-med and St. Olaf has such great um, pre-med advising and prepares students really well for medical school. We, have like a significantly higher percentage of students applying to medical school and getting in than like the national average. Um, so that was definitely really appealing. And while I'm not pre-med anymore, I'm pre-health now, um, the advising is still there and I can still like go to our career center, which Katie was talking about and um, get resources from them. So um, yeah, those are my three different reasons. Awesome. So we I'd just like have... to follow up with what Rebecca yeah. said about um, pre-med is we do get a lot of students at St. Olaf who are interested in, in uh, pre-med as an option. And then once they get there, get, get here, they see there's so many different ways to get um, a position in the health fields. And it really opens up opportunities. I teach a course on medical anthropology. So I work with a lot of students who are interested in health in um, public health like Rebecca is, or for people who want to be a physician, or for people who want to be uh, in nursing in some way, or PT, or OT, or a lot of different paths. So um, there's good synergy around uh, those kinds of interests. Yeah, I always like to mention, and I think this confuses some prospective students, but you really can major in anything you want at St. Olaf and still go pre-med. Um, and I think that's a awesome thing at St. Olaf, but some students think they have to major in biology or chemistry to do that. And I had a friend who majored in English and still went pre-med. So it happens and students really have a wide variety of interests at St. Olaf. 
Um, so what about, and this is not necessarily specific to St. Olaf, but the winter weather is something that deters some students. So what, um, can you talk about the winter weather a little bit? Is it limiting? What activities do students um, like to do outside? Maybe Rebecca, you can talk to the activities piece about that. Yeah, so winter is definitely cold, like can't get around it. But um, one thing that I really think is fun is that even in the winter, people in Minnesota, which I'm from the Midwest, and I feel like this wasn't as much the case in Illinois, but here in Minnesota, people still love to get outside in the winter. I think just because it's so long. Um, so a couple of things that people like doing on campus, I think the biggest thing is going sledding, um, especially once it snows. Um, yeah, people will steal calf trays and go down the hills, especially Old Main Hill. That's definitely like a perk to being on a hill is that you um, have a ton of places to go sledding. I ended up buying a sled freshman year because I was like, I want to go sledding and not hurt myself because calf trays can be a little dangerous. But that's definitely one thing that people love to do. Um, another thing that I want to try before I graduate is in our natural lands, they have the Nordic cross-country skiing team um, groom trails so that you can go and like cross-country ski out in the natural lands. And so I know you can, you don't even have to have skis. Um, they have some that you can rent um, and then use to go skiing in the natural lands. So I'm hoping that I can do that sometime hopefully before I graduate but that's a couple of things that people like to do at least outside in the winter time. I lived in southeastern Michigan I did my doctorate at University of Michigan and it can be 35 degrees and cloudy and wet and that can feel more cold than 20 degrees and brilliant um, sunshine so there's ways that we we find we tell, things we tell ourselves to make it through it. Yeah. Completely. You just kind of band together and experience it as an entire campus, I feel like, in the winter. And if you don't want to participate in like the January weather of Minnesota, you can just study abroad. That's what I chose to do. So I just got out of Minnesota for January when I was at St. Olaf. Um, what about um, the core humanity courses or just general education courses in general, maybe Tom, you can speak a little bit to generally what those are um, and kind of the learning outcomes and things like that from them. So we just recently revised our general education requirements and they'll be in place next year for new first year students. And they're designed to help you um, experiment with a lot of different things to take a social science course, to take a natural science course, to take a course that examines issues of race and power. We have a first year seminar for students to help them think about their adjustment to college and where they are. And um, we ask students to take two religion courses and those can be really great ways to think about issues of ethics and faith and whether that's something that you are personally a believer or not, but just to increase your literacy of that really crucial part of human experience, um, to take an arts class just to give you um, that nudge to explore different kinds of things. Because like Rebecca suggested, you know, people can start with one thing and then they encounter something else and think, wow, this is pretty interesting. This course I took um, as one of my general education requirements became my major. And that is uh, something what we can hear frequently from students. Awesome. Um, and Rebecca, what about, so, I think it's hard to answer what the most popular student clubs um, are on campus, but maybe just generally, what is it like on campus outside of your academics? Yeah, um, I feel like Oli's in general are very involved um, as like a college. I think like most people I know are at least in a club or two or music and athletics and a club. Um, Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing how involved we are in things. But I think overall, it's a great, like people have so many different passions um, and stuff like that. And so you definitely have people who are involved in athletics who are also in different clubs or in music in different clubs or just a bunch of different clubs. Um, I think if we were to say like what the most popular student like 
organization it is, it'd probably be all the different um, things involved with student government. So like you can be part of the Senate, you can do um, like after dark committee. So they create activities for the evening. Um, there's like the music committee, that's not the name of it, but they focus on bringing in like artists or students on campus to perform. Um, so there's like so many different branches of our student government. And so there's a ton of people involved in that. And so I say that's the biggest like club on campus. Um, yeah, I'd say also like different like cultural organizations are really popular too. Um, I'm involved with the Filipino club on campus and um, I know a lot of other people are involved in like sort of different other cultural clubs as well on campus. I'm the advisor for the Hmong student organization. We actually have two organizations for students of Hmong descent and um, I've been impressed just how active they are and creative they are of marking Hmong New Year and Hmong foods and sharing Hmong culture and language training and those kinds of things. We also, like Rebecca said, um, student government allows students to work with faculty on some significant in initiatives. So we had, a, when we revised the general edu education requirements, we had two students who worked so hard, were so invaluable in that process. And I think they learned a lot too from that. So there's also chances to do research and other things where, where students and faculty can work together. Awesome. And I'm not sure if either of you can speak to this at all, but I can answer it if not. But um, we have a student that is looking to be in art education. And I know that there are, studio art is a really big and popular major at St. Olaf, but generally, um, speaking to the like studio art major at all do either of you have experience with that if not i can talk a little bit about it too i just know that the studio art I, the students who are studio art majors just develop a really strong bond because they spend a lot of time together working mm -hmm. on their projects and um so i just have found that to be an interesting um subculture of itself I don't know how exactly how it pairs with the, because we also have an education program, a licensure program. So I don't know, Katie, if you know more about that. Yeah, and Rebecca, do you know anything about that before I um, I guess one thing I'll mention, the one thing I do know is that they do like a senior project at the end and like they all present it. And they just did that recently for the seniors last year because they didn't get to do it at the end of the year. So um, that's really cool. Like you get to see all the senior art majors, like all their art. And it's always so amazing to see like these people who are so creative and talented. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And I do, so we do have a strong studio art major and you really can customize that a lot. It's um, one of the majors where you really, there's so many offerings within the studio art major and there are a few general classes that you do have to take, but then you really can tailor it to what you're specifically interested in. But when you're looking at art education, we do also have um, right now, it is just a concentration for education, but it is a licensure and it's changing into a major next year. So that is something that's really exciting for a lot of students. It's really allowing you to take credit for all the work that you're doing. So it's not changing too much. It's just really allowing for you to take credit for all the work that you do in that concentration turning into a major because it is pretty much already a major, we just don't call it a major right now. Um, but for that, you can major in studio art and major in education, and then you would pretty much get a licensure for art education then. So that's like the best way to go about that if you are specifically interested in art education. I just wanna to mention too, it is actually a major as of now. My roommate just had to switch up to the I did not major, know that. So. That's awesome, yeah. That's exciting. That's super awesome. So one thing that I did want to talk about, um, so study abroad is a huge thing at St. Olaf and I wanted to hear about each of your personal experiences with studying abroad. I'm not sure if you have any, but if you do, I would love to hear about them and then I can share mine as well. 
Well, I can start off. Um, when I was a junior at St. Olaf, I had the opportunity to go study in Thailand for a semester and it changed really my entire life because I then went on to graduate school to study about Southeast Asia and that was, I ended up living in Asia for about another six years after that. So it's really a transformative moment and I owe so much to those professors and to St. Olaf's program that they had created um, that allowed us to do that. So um, that's been just, I mean, kind of at, from age 20, everything changed for me. Yeah, and then I've been able to do two programs here at St. Olaf. I did a January um, in India with a St. Olaf professor and um, there was 10 students and an alumni and it was an incredible experience, four weeks traveling to a couple different cities around India and um, yeah, it was incredible. And then last spring, I was studying abroad. Actually, also, I went to Thailand, so that was a coincidence. Um, and I was studying community public health in Thailand and um, unfortunately had to come home due to COVID, but um, it, it was also an incredible experience. We got to go into like villages and I got to do some traveling before COVID shut everything down. So yeah, it was an incredible experience. And that was a non-St. Olaf program, which is an option, but definitely a lot more difficult than um, St. Olaf programs. I was, I was looking for something super specific in my study abroad program. So that's why I chose to do um, a non St. Olaf program. Awesome. Yeah. And I took advantage of the January term courses. So I did three out of my four January terms. I went to Ecuador for a Spanish class. I went to Israel for a history class. And then I went to Australia and New Zealand for an arts and literature course. So all not a part of my major at all. It's um, a plug for getting your general education requirements out of the way sometimes. It also helps with that. I really wanted to learn in the countries that I was learning about versus taking my general education requirements at St. Olaf for some of them. So I chose to do that. And I also got out of Minnesota during the winter. So it was beneficial in a few ways, but um, I always tell students you should at least study abroad one time during your time in college, regardless of where you go, because it can be transformative for sure. Um, so one student asked about our students on campus now. Yes, they are. So um, Rebecca is on campus now and Tom is on campus, I think, in his office. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about what campus is like, maybe Tom from the um, teaching side and Rebecca from the student side? Well, it is a little strange. Everyone in masks and distanced and um, trying to negotiate how to best work with each other. But on the other hand, people are excited to be back with their friends and out of their parents' homes. And so it's been, um, it's been a really meaningful um, semester to teach that way. Yeah, it's definitely very strange on campus, especially I had many years with a quote unquote normal campus. And so it definitely is weird, but again, just grateful to be here. Um, a lot of things are a lot different. Um, we all had to like quarantine at the beginning and get tested and they're doing like periodic testing, but yeah, we are on campus and we've been here for a couple months now. So I'll, I'll take that every day. <laughs> Yeah, and for visits, we are not open for your normal like information session, interview, campus tour type visits. We are offering driving tours of campus. So on those tours, you there's geolocations throughout campus where you'll um, listen to a pre-recorded audio at each of the spots. So it really covers our normal campus tour really well, but it is completely from your car. Um, and then we also do have our info sessions online and interviews online as well. So you can get a similar experience, but it's not completely in person as of now. Um, and then the dance program. So I, for dance, um, it's very 
um, similar to the studio art major in the sense that you can really customize it to be the type of program that you want. We offer a lot of different dance courses and you'll have students from across the entire college taking a lot of those courses because they do fulfill some general education requirements, but they also, um, I know a lot of students that double major with dance because they're interested in maybe the um, education side or they're interested in um, exercise science, so more of that side of it and doing dance with that major, but a lot of students will combine two majors together to double major and major with dance as well. I'm not sure, um, Rebecca or Tom, if you know anything else about the dance major, but I would just say generally it is a really customizable major, which I know can sound um, daunting maybe because you have so many choices, but it really allows you if you have a specific type of dance that you are um, passionate about that you can really focus your major on that. The only thing I would add is that our Center for um, Art and Dance is a really first rate facility. So that is uh, a really a wonderful place to uh, work and develop as an artist. Yeah, and then I'll also add that um, outside of like the major major, there's also two dance companies on campus. Um, and one of them focuses on like international dances as well. So um, that's a cool opportunity to learn like dances from around the world too. Yeah, awesome. So next question about Asian languages and Asian study. I think I'm gonna leave that to Tom to answer that question. So we have a, a program in uh, Japanese language and also a program in Mandarin. And those are allow students to take um, courses at multiple levels. We also have a program called the Asian Conversation for students studying those languages, where they can take a, a series of courses um, about Asia and also have the opportunity to travel to Asia over January, either to uh, Shanghai or to Tokyo, depending on the language that they're studying. So um, we have a very robust Asian studies um, program. Yeah, awesome. And then do, Rebecca, maybe to you, do most students have cars on campus and just generally what are the options to get off campus if you don't have a car around Northfield and then up to Minneapolis as well? Yeah, so I'd say like a decent number of students have cars on campus. It's definitely not like a big percentage of people because um, there's just limited parking space. You have to apply for a parking permit. And then if you are accepted, then um, you have to like pay a fee. I'm not exactly sure how much it is. Typically, first years won't have cars on campus. It's typically like sophomores and up. Um, and then if you don't have a car on campus, a couple ways you can get um, around Northfield is that there's a bus system that runs around Northfield. So it stops like periodically at St. Olaf and you can take it like over to Carleton to downtown Northfield. You can get to Cub Food and Target, so like the grocery stores. Um, yeah, I used to take it all the time to get to Target if I needed things um, the first couple years when I didn't have friends who had cars on campus. Um, and then in terms of like getting up to the cities, the Twin Cities, um, there's a bus system also that runs from Northfield to the airport, to Minneapolis and to a couple other places up that way. I think Mall of America too. And it's like a flat rate of like $15 one way. So definitely not the cheapest, but not bad either. I take that quite often when I would fly back and forth from home. So um, definitely doable. It's nice to have those options. Like it's relatively easy without a car generally, like to get around Northfield at least. Yeah, I would completely agree. And I also was from out of state at the time when I went to St. Olaf and I used the bus system to get to the airport all the time. It's super great because you don't have to park at the airport. So even if you do have a car on campus, I still used the bus system to get home. Um, and it does depend on the friend group you're in, but a lot of people 
do like to go up to the cities as well. So sometimes people will carpool if you just want to go into downtown Minneapolis or downtown St. Paul. Um, I did have a lot of friends that like to do that when I was at St. Olaf. We do have two rental cars on campus too, which I never used at St. Olaf, but I know that it is a great option for you if you potentially have an interview or um, something where you have to get up to the cities and you're not going with another person. That's a great option for you. They're specifically for students, so there's no extra fee for being um, younger and renting a car. They're just specifically for St. Olaf students. Um, one question that I have that we haven't covered yet is, um, can both of you talk a little bit about the professor-student relationship at St. Olaf and how that's um, unique to a small school, especially St. Olaf. Rebecca, you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll start with like in terms of like for classes and availability, availability to like talk about class material wise. Um, all professors are required to have office hours. Um, so you can go and talk to them. Most professors are willing to do like by appointment too if like certain their office hours like don't work for you. Um, and most of my professors, especially like first year courses, they're like, come visit, like come talk to me. Like I'm sitting in my office for this time. Obviously it's a little different right now, but like they used to say like, oh, I'm, I'm sitting in my office, like come talk to me, like I'm sitting here for you guys to so come visit, just talk about anything. Um, so like office hours are such a great opportunity to like talk about course material, but also to get to know your professor like beyond the classroom. And I found that like a lot of professors want to get to know like your outside interests besides like within that class or like course material they want to get to know like what it, what like what's your major like what are you planning on doing after college like what are your interests outside of like this class um which i think is definitely really special to small schools and to say no of yeah and i think that that's really the key part about a small liberal arts college of just having that chance to talk about course material sure but those some of those bigger things about just how you're making the adjustment to college, why you're here, how to make it through, and then how to think about next steps and having those opportunities to talk with students that way. Just yesterday, I had a student who was trying to plot out how to do two majors. And so we met yesterday at, um, just on Zoom and talked for about a half hour. And it's just really, it's like, oh, wow, this is just makes it sound so much more doable. I have another student that I'm doing an independent study with. And so she and I weren't able to meet on Friday like we normally do. So we also met yesterday afternoon on Zoom. And, and it's really nice. It's a course that she's very passionately interested in. She's designed it herself. And it's just fun for me to, to learn from her and learn along with her as she explores those kinds of things. There's a lot of summer opportunities for summer research. We have a collaborative uh, research initiative where you can work maybe with a couple of other students on a professor's project and learn about research and get some really good experience and meet some other students and get to know a professor in a, in a different kind of way. So there's lots of opportunities to have those kinds of, of intersections. So, so wherever it is that you go, really try to make the most of those opportunities that are really precious ones. Yeah, I think you, something that I always tell students that are looking at St. Olaf or potentially have applied and deposited and are coming is that you reaching out to professors can create so many opportunities that you don't realize because professors have their specific interests and things that they're doing on the side that they love to bring students into a lot of times. So I have a lot of friends who would get a part of yeah a research opportunity or maybe an internship just because they spoke to a professor and were really interested in that specific topic um, so that's something that i always tell students just go have that first conversation with the professor you never know where it's going to take you as we like to say 80 percent of us are just regular human beings so <laughs> exactly um, so I know we just have two more minutes, but I did want to answer the last question really quick. So um, it, speaking about primary lecture 
like our class is primarily lecture or um, like concentration, concentrated classes with, you know, more conversation. I'd say it depends on your major, but a lot of classes are um, conversational in nature. And if it is a lecture based class, you will have a lot of those opportunities to meet in smaller groups and have those conversations. But a lot of your intro science courses and some other intro courses will be more lecture based. But I think as you get more advanced and senior in your courses, they get more and more conversational. So just depends on the major, but that's a general overview of that type of class. Just in time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom, Katie, and Rebecca for such great information. Congratulations, Rebecca, on almost graduating. And I hope that for our, our audience, this information was very valuable. Um, take note of our panelists' uh, questions, especially Katie and Tom. Uh, if you have any questions, you can look them up and perhaps email them. So we thank you for your participation today. Just a um, couple of notes as we conclude this session. There will be a quick survey after we end this session. So please take the time and complete that. Um, if you are interested in attending any other sessions, once again, sign up at our website, iacac.org. And just another reminder that this recording will be available um, in a couple of weeks. So you have access to this information and best of luck to everyone on your college research. And thank you again to our panelists for today, today's information. Have a great one. Take care. Bye. Thank you.